What is going on, everyone? We are now live. Tonight's going to be a lot of fun, dude. I have Mick Kuzviz uh, and my boy, Mr. Alex Rudd, and we're going to be talking crankbaits, which we already did a little crankbait seminar with Alex, just small body cranking stuff, talking sort of like Highland Reservoir, like the style of cranking Alex does. But with Nick on here, we get to do a little bit other, a uh, little bit different stuff where we're talking Great Lakes crankbaits, smallmouth, giant smallmouth, and just, you know. A lot of really exciting stuff. So I'm excited for everyone to hop in here and uh, ask some questions. But we're just going to hang out for a couple minutes and let people kind of funnel in. What's going on, guys? Not much, man. Not much. Getting excited about this. Love talking crankbaits. Nick, so kind of introduce yourself to the people. Everyone knows Alex. Alex is on here a lot. But introduce yourself. Where are you from? Yeah, and sure. How would you get into this? Yeah, Nick Kuzvis. I'm from uh, uh, Ontario, Canada, right outside of uh, the Big Smoke in Toronto. Uh, you know, I started fishing when I was 13 years old. Nobody in my family fished. I went out with a buddy's grandfather. And, uh, you know, uh, how else can I say it other than I got hooked after that first day? And that was it. I, you know, I remember being in school and uh, all I did was draw pictures of bass boats and bass jumping out of the water, <laughs> which probably uh, reflected what my marks were like when I was in uh, high school, because that's, that's all I spent my time on. But, you know, I really... Um, we started off fishing a lot of largemouth here back in the days that that was sort of a lot of our tournaments were inland lakes. It was a lot of largemouth. There were some smallmouth, but you couldn't win back then on smallmouth. Slowly as the years went on, these smallmouth started getting bigger. And then we started moving from the inland inland lakes more to the Great Lakes. And then you just had to force yourself to learn the smallmouth deal. I, I remember the first year I had to fish Lake Simcoe, which is a big inland lake. And it's one of our trophy uh, lakes up here for smallmouth. I got my butt handed to me, you know, trying to beat guys fishing largemouth and, and it didn't happen. So since that year, basically I put all my efforts into smallmouth, spent a lot of time with jerk baits, crank baits, you know, finesse techniques. Every year I tried to learn something new to better myself. Cause back in those days, the big question was, is it better to be really good at one thing or just be good at a bunch of things? And, you know, to me, the answer is right now, it, it's more important to be a little bit more versatile because certain conditions, I remember I grew up as a jerkbait fisherman on the smallmouth side, and that's all I wanted to throw. I was actually addicted to it. But on the Great Lakes, if the conditions aren't right, if you have big winds and stuff like that, it muddies up that shallow water, that shallow water bite dies, and then you're, you're left in an open ocean wondering what to do next. So I had to get I had to learn the drop shot, the tube thing, you know, the shaky head, try and figure out some deep water techniques that were going to work and then the all in between stuff. So, you know, throughout all this time, it's made me a better angler for sure. So I'm kind of curious. You, t you said kind of what happened here as well. The smallmouth were never really a big player. Like you go catch 16 pounds on the Lake Huron yeah. and you do really, really well. Like if you had 16, it was muddy. You had a lot of dirt and, and nastiness. Yeah. What has really changed for you guys um, that's made the smallmouth really come out to play more? Well, you know, for sure in the Great Lakes, it's, it's got, I mean, it's got to be the gobies and the zebra mussels. So when the zebra mussels were introduced to these Great Lakes, especially Lake Erie, I mean, Lake Erie was a murky, muddy lake at, at one time. It, it, those zebra mussels came in and just filtered all that, that murk and those particles out. And it, it just cleared it right up. Lake, Lake Ontario has always been a clear lake. So those lakes, if you think of Bassmaster tournaments back in like the nineties and stuff like that, like 16, 17 pounds is a really good bag of smallmouth. Now 16, 17 pounds. I mean, we fish a four fish tournament and 16, 17 pounds won't even put you in the top 20. This is no, no word. Like we weighed. Uh, two years ago, we came second in the in the Thousand Islands Open, and we weighed 1970, 2070, and 2207, and we didn't even win. We came in second, and that's on four fish, so 12 fish. That's insane, dude. It's, it's ah. crazy. But for sure, the Gobies have had something to do with it. Um, you know, the other thing that's really changed, and it, it'd be interesting to get a biologist up to talk about this, was, you know, I remember back in the days catching smallmouth even in deep water, and you never had to fizz them. Why all of a sudden do you have to fizz them now? Even in St. Clair, which guys for years never fizz smallmouth, if you're catching them in deeper than 14, 15 feet, those fish flip upside down. You have to fizz them. Hmm. Is it because they're gluttons? Is it something to do with their body weight? Like, well, what is it? I, I don't know. But Dude, I, I, I'm, yeah, like I don't that's know. That's so unique. It, Maybe it mass and like, you know, the more a fish weighs, right, yeah. the more pressure is going to be exerted on it when it's at the bottom. You That's know what, what I mean? I'm thinking. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It has to be right. Yeah. Because 
even in shallow water, if they come up shallow from deep water, if they haven't acclimatized themselves, like they're just moving up and you get those big black ones that come up from deep water. If you catch one, it'll flip over right away. Even though it was in shallow water, I guess the stress and the fighting just, you know, you, they, you think they're good and you check them like 10 minutes later, they're upside down. So the Gobies have been a big deal here and they're growing super, super big. Uh, even if you look at the St. Lawrence River where the lake was really coming out with the big weights and the river just wasn't, but slowly those fish. Now I'm assuming part of it is to a lot of guys that were catching fish out in the lake. They were being let go in the river. And, and I think a lot of anglers, they make the assumption that smallmouth always go back. I, I don't think that that's true, right? It's got deep water. It has all the bait fish. Like you can't drive a hundred yards without seeing a pot of uh, perch or something in that river. I think they just figure it out. And, you know, some of them do. A, a, this is a funny story. A, a buddy of mine caught a, a bass off a bed right at the mouth of the St. Lawrence River in, uh, in late June. Drove it all the way up to Brockville, which is about 45 miles away, right? Two weeks later, he fished another tournament, caught that same fish off the same bed two weeks later. Same scar on its side, was yeah. on that bed again. I mm. mean, get like, what is up with that? Like, I, I said, man, that's crazy. You're, you're not smoking something, but he said, no, man, <laughs> I'm telling you the truth that, you know, as God is my witness. So, you know. Dude. Some of them do, but I think a lot of them have, you know, they'll stay if, if it's got everything they need, the deep water and the bait fish, I think they hang around. So I'm also, I, I also believe that too, especially during the spawn, maybe they're more willing to travel to get back to where they need to yeah. be. But like during the summer months, I don't know that they really have the need to. It, it's like St. Clair when the guys bring all those fish over from Canada and come back over to the United States, right? And they yeah. bring all those fish over to Metro or Harley or wherever they're weighing at, or even up to Erie. Yeah. And like those fish don't need to go back. Why would they? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So no. No. super, super interesting. Yeah. So we have about 43 people in here. Um, what tonight's live stream is going to really be about is Great Lakes crankbaits. Um, and Alex is a phenomenal, phenomenal crankbait fisherman. So it's going to be really cool to get his perspective on some stuff too. Um, but what we're going to do is give you guys a little intro for the podcast because this is also going to go up on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google um, Podcasts, and all the other streaming platforms. So we're going to give you guys a little introduction, and then we're going to get this thing rolling. What's going on, everyone? This is Ben Nowak, and welcome to the podcast tonight. We're going to be talking about Great Lakes crankbaits with Mr. Nick Kuzviz and Mr. Alex Rudd, two phenomenal crankbait anglers. Uh, what's going to be really cool about this is Nick has a ton of experience fishing Erie, Ontario, Simcoe, and all these other phenomenal giant smallmouth bodies of water. So we're going to get a really cool perspective there, talking JDM baits, mega bass, kind of how he breaks these bodies of water down, and give you guys everything you need to know about Great Lakes crankbait fishing. We're also recording this on a live stream on my YouTube channel. So go over and check it out. If you guys want to interact with us and give us questions live during the podcast, so check this out. Go over and interact live on my YouTube channel or listen like you are right now on the podcast version. But Nick, what's going on, my man? Hey, not much, man. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited. Yeah, absolutely. So we're basically going to set this up the same as we always do. We're going to start by talking about when you would typically fish crankbaits and kind of break it down, right? Because there's lipless and there's um, medium divers or whatever, how you switch throughout the year. Where you fish them, how you fish them, and then the gear that we're going to do uh, that you use to be effective. And we'll just kind of go through it, pretty loose conversation, and, and answer some questions that might come up throughout. So, um, yeah, let's kind of dive into this thing. Give yourself a quick introduction for the people listening on the podcast. I know we just did this for the live stream, yeah. but uh, give them a little bit of context on who you are and, and kind of how you got into crankbait fishing. Yeah, uh, my name is Nick Kuzvis. I'm from uh, Toronto, well, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, just outside of Toronto. Um, you know, really crankbait fishing for me, it started a long time ago. A lot of guys up in the North Country weren't using it. There was a lot of tournaments being won down south. And I, I just felt it was it was a bait that guys were kind of overlooking up here. Our water's clear and a lot of guys just thought, you know, they get to more finesse stuff, you know, swim baits. They threw to a lot of jigs back then. And, you know, the crankbait was just such a new thing up here. I spent a lot of time fishing crankbaits. I, I spent anything from uh, square bills, uh, deep divers, and actually won a few tournaments on some deep divers on lakes where guys traditionally at the time weren't throwing a lot of crankbaits. So, uh, you know, it's a fantastic bait. It's an overlooked bait, especially up here. 
And, you know, it, it's just something that you got to play around with. It's not, a, it, you know, a lot of guys think it's just a chuck and wine. And in some cases it, it can be, but there's some, you know, intricacies and setups on your rod and line and all that stuff that make a real difference. And, you know, we'll get into that, I'm sure. But, uh, you know, I love, love crankbaits. Love. That's awesome, dude. Yeah. And that's one of the biggest misconceptions, right? Is a guy thinks you put a crankbait in your hand, especially for smallmouth, put a crankbait in your hand. And you just go crank it, like casting and winding. But on the Great yeah. Lakes, it's not at all that way, like especially big water. And uh, it, it's really a targeted approach. You have to know what you're looking for, whether it's bait fish or cover or structure. So I'm really excited to uh, get into yeah. it. And Mr. Yeah. Alex Rudd's on here as well. And, uh, yeah, I'm just sitting so. down here. I'm, I'm here more to just uh, observe and absorb. You know what I mean? I'm yeah, usually the too, one listening. I listen, I I host my own podcast, right? And and we do the live stream and I got my own YouTube channel. So usually I'm like the big mouth guy that does all the talking. And so tonight I'm just going to listen because when it comes to Great Lake fishing, see, I know nothing about it. I'm down here in Tennessee other than what I've done with Ben. You know, Ben has been like, I'm like, Ben, what do I do? Where do I go? What, you know, just tell me what to do. I have like no experience Great Lakes fishing by myself, right? And so when guys start talking Great Lakes, I get fascinated by it because What's crazy is some of these lakes down here around me are starting to get zebra mussels in them. They're starting to get perch in them. They're, the smallmouth are getting bigger. They're getting deeper. They're getting more aggressive than they ever were before. And so I'm starting to take things that I learned fishing, you know, like Huron and, and St. Clair with Ben when I'm up there with him and applying it down here and being able to catch fish. And so when I hear the words crankbait and Great Lake, because I love crankbait fish, you know, I was down here in East Tennessee is like the, the birthplace of building your own crankbaits and flat sides and, and, you know, balsa wood crankbaits. And so I get all geeked out about it when I can learn something new. So I'm just going to sit here and I'll, I'll interject if I have any questions. Don't worry. Yeah, please do. <laughs> and that mega bass crankbait talk real quick about that mega bass. And we talked about with Eric, but, uh, Oh, that, the LBO, the, the yeah, the prototype yeah. one or whatever, the oh, field my, test. Yeah, the field test. Yeah, I got a um, I, I'm a little bit of a collector, so I collect a lot of like JDM stuff. Yeah. And I actually have a um, bought it literally just as a collector's item. Right. It is a uh, Mega Bass um 200 X, and okay, it yeah. is a field test version. Yeah. And so it's one of 300 that they made and it has a unique chamber rattling chamber weight transfer system than the other 300 That's because right. they were one of 300 and they were testing them all and trying to narrow them down. And so yeah, that, I bought yeah. it just to bought it just to have it just to, you know, say hey, I got it because I love that that 200X. It's re it's just a phenomenal crankbait. Really it's a great crankbait, yeah. It, yeah. It's fascinating. I mean, it, it was one of those deals when I started playing with, uh, you know, I'd always thrown a vision, right? Like the vision's like the king of jerk baits. And then I thought, yeah. well, Mega Bass makes a lot of really cool crankbaits that I've never even touched yeah. because I've always been focused more on, you know, the bandits and like trying to find old wiggle warts and stuff like that just because that's the culture down here. Of course, yeah. And I started picking up some of those those Mega Bass crankbaits, especially that, that 200X, and it just like, open my mind to a whole nother realm yeah. of crankbait fishing and it's, it's wicked. So, yeah. So that, that LBO system, it, it's a new system that they came out with. They've, they've added it to some of their jerk baits as well. Mm -hmm. And then they have a micro LBO LBO. That's even a smaller one. It fits in a chamber that basically it's like, it goes from one side of the crankbait to the other and it yeah. has a magnet uh, back at the head. So mm -hmm. when you cast it, you give it that snap will allow the weight to go to the back. So mm -hmm. your bait's not spinning in the air. When it hits the boat, the water, as soon as you start giving it one, one or two cranks, that head dips down and that mm -hmm. weight just slides all the way down and then locks in to yep. that magnet. So it holds it there, keeps the head down and maximizes your depth. It gets it down quickly. The action's fantastic. I mean, the thing about Mega Bass that really, uh, and I mean, I, I've been a Mega Bass fan for a long time since I was getting them back in Japan. Now, back then it was mainly jerk baits. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that I've loved about them since I've been with them is that they really give you, they, they don't miss anything, any mm -hmm. category, anything I need a crankbait for, whether I'm looking for a wide wobble, a, you know, a tight wobble, a, mm -hmm. a deep diver, shallow, square bill. You know, they have the S cranks. They give you a whole different action. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we'll get into that. They just give me everything that I need. So it's not that I don't use other other manufacturer stuff. I like to see what's out there. I like to test them and check them out against against what we have. But man, you know, you can just you can just go in and buy a bunch of them, and you're you've, you haven't missed a beat, or you're not missing something that you're man. I wish I had this. 
Yeah. Yeah. And that LBO, man, that, that system, that's what fascinated me more than anything about, you know, that the, the, you know, ones I bought last year and started experimenting with was, you know, down here in Tennessee, we get a lot of wind just like you guys do. And right. we'll have days and like the good days for fishing down here is when the wind's blowing 15, 20 miles an hour. And the thing is, is when you're fishing into the wind with a crankbait that doesn't weigh that much, it gets real annoying real quick. Yeah. <laughs> and so what I found was like, instead of fighting with a bandit, which throws like a, you know, a potato chip most days, <laughs> I, could, I could throw that mega bass on. And not only was yeah. I throwing something that I could rock it where I wanted to go, but I was also yeah. showing those fish something that they're not seeing very often That's because right. a lot of the guys I fish around, they don't use mega bass. They just don't. It's not something down here in our fishing culture is just a big deal. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And so it was, I had a ton of success on it last year. It was, it was really awesome to kind of see really late season when nothing else seemed to work. And, you know, I was having to slow down and drag the jig and throw the Demiki rig and do all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I started throwing that LBO 200 and it was like, Oh, there's still fish here that want to eat a crank. <laughs> this is awesome. So it, it's pretty good. So uh, That's really good, man. That's good. I'm, yeah. I'm glad you're enjoying it. It's yep. a great bait. Yeah. yeah, so you kind of touched on it, but like there's so many different crankbaits. Like, is there a time of year that you would say is your go-to for cranking? Is it like early spring? Is it something you fish all year long? You just change the style of crankbait? Like kind of what is your perspective on this? Yeah, you know, so there, there are little pockets of, of times that we I don't really use it just because it depends on the lake. So you get into Lake Ontario in the middle of the summer. It, it's hard because most of those fish doesn't mean you, you can go up in the river and get them shallow. And there are fish that are constantly rotating from deep to shallow throughout the days. You know, you can get them on jerk baits. That same fish will, can be caught in two feet of water at one o'clock and in four o'clock it's in 30 or 40 feet of water, 300 yards down. So you can use them, but it, it's, it's a hard bite in the summertime on that lake. Lake St. Clair is a whole other ball game, right? So I use a lot of crankbaits, but in the springtime, when we get out to the Finger Lakes and stuff like that, because here, actually Ontario just opened their season for catch and release on the Ontario side. So we're all, I'm, there's a lot of guys that from Ontario that are super stoked about this because we've never been able to fish bass. Like ever. I mean, I've been doing it for 40 years. The season has been closed. You cannot fish it until the third week of June. So we've always been crossing the border and fishing the Finger Lakes, going into Michigan and trying some of the inland lakes or St. Clair. Uh, you know, square bill in the spring is a big thing of mine. I really, really love it. I love shoreline fishing. You got to think about spring, early season, when that water starts to warm up, that upper column is going to warm up faster than anything else. So those shallow rock flats or wood or anywhere where there's dock posts, where those docks will be in the summertime, they, those bass will slide up in there. And I mean, I've been on some of these lakes literally two days after ice off and there's already fish shallow. If you get a nice calm day and it, if you just look, if you, if you look at the surface temp and you put your, your, I have a probe that goes down to give me the temperature down. I mean, it could be 44 degrees on the bottom and five feet of water and a foot under the water. It's like 47, like a three degrees difference. So if it's calm and the water's not moving around, they'll come up shallow looking for food. And that square bill is money. And the square bill is awesome because of that, that square lip on it. Like you see here, try and get it in there. I know most guys know this, but some guys don't, that gives you great deflection rate. So it'll bounce off wood. It'll bounce off rock. They don't get hung up uh, uh, anywhere near as much as other crankbaits. You know, generally square bills will dive anywhere from, you know, say two to five, six feet of water. Uh, the sonic side, which is another one that mega bass makes like this. This has got the flat side, so you can see how flat that is compared to the uh, S-crank. So when it's really cold, see how much wider that is. When it's really, really cold, I like that tight wobble better that the Sonic side gives me. It goes a little bit deeper, but if I go with mono rather than fluorocarbon, it gives me some lift. So it won't get down as deep. So you can play around with a bait and make it dive. Maximum depth is maximum depth. The only way you can get it to dive deeper is if you add weight to it for it to sink. But we love our crankbaits to float back up. So when we hit any kind of cover, whatever, you stop it and it goes back up and then you can continue your retrieve. If that was to sink down, it just get you caught up. So square bills in the springtime are my favorite by far. On St. Clair, I really love the lipless early in the season. You know, and I'll go, I actually will go anywhere from half ounce. This is a three quarter ounce. 
if I'm trying to cover water and I'm looking for fish and I'm fishing a little bit deeper, I like the three quarter ounce if I'm up shallower. Because remember, this bait is sinking. It doesn't float on you. So if you're trying to retrieve it slow, it's going gonna, it's gonna to keep going down. So to keep it up, you got to reel it faster. And in that cold water, sometimes they don't want to chase it. So I'll go to the half ounce. And if I find fish, then I'll go to, uh, you know, I may slow down or do whatever. But I'm always throwing a crankbait. They're great search baits. I find a lot of fish with them. And I mean, what a lot of guys don't understand, they don't just catch a lot of fish, but they are a big fish bait. There's a misconception with some yeah. with some that, that feel like, okay, I find them on a crankbait. I get a couple small ones, then I'll throw a drop shot or I'll throw a tube or a jig and they all catch big fish. But man, I've caught some of my biggest fish on crankbaits in the spring. Some of my biggest fish have come on crankbaits. So that's yeah, kind yeah. of, yeah. I, I'm kind of the same way, man. Like in the springtime that that lipless really is king for me, whether I'm fishing up in the column, like casting and winding, trying to find right. shallow fish, whether it's around shallow grass or shallow rock. Yeah. Um, but even like dragging a lipless in the spring on St. Clair, a lot of guys are fishing a blade, right? And that yeah. water gets dirty. So you're fishing blades, which have no sound or just the vibration of the bait. Right. But then you pick up like, uh, um, door realis G fix 68, right. Which is a super, super narrow, thin body. And you can fish it like a blade bit, but you have sound. So whether you're fishing it on bottom or you're fishing it up in the column, like there's so many different ways to fish it. The crankbait, it's like a very versatile technique. But it is, kind of yeah. once you move off St. Clair, kind of once you move to like Erie and Huron and these, you know, Ontario, I'm sure it doesn't play near as much in the summertime. But St. Yeah. Clair is like an anomaly in the sense that it's so shallow. It is, yeah. That you can fish it all year long. Yeah. And it's not just an anomaly that you can fish it all year long, but how you fish it in a lot of ways. Like, you know, it's the one place that you want to crankbait that doesn't get down and dig you into the weeds. You're just running it over top of them and you're taking off that end. You're not, you may not even hit anything and they hit it where generally you're thinking a crankbait is always a contact bait. It's hitting a rock. Mm -hmm. It's hitting a piece yeah. of wood. In this case, you can just run it right down in open water. And I mean, big small mouth eat that thing. <laughs> as well as some musky and pike as well. But yeah, uh, you, you know, know. It, we you know what that, you know. What's fascinating about that is is that's something we do down here in the spring too, you know, is, except for bluff walls. We'll get on bluffs and fish, you know, your three XDs and your rock crawlers and even sometimes five XDs. And like a lot of people ask me, you know, like, are you hitting the bottom or, or what are you focusing on? A lot of the times we're just reeling it down a bluff yeah. and never touching the bottom. And 90% of the time, you know, we're focusing on these big river smallmouth that are living in this current and they just come up off those bluff walls. And if yeah. you're touching the bluff, they won't eat it. It's fascinating. That's but amazing. as long as you're just kind of out there in the middle of nothing, it's like that smallmouth that triggers something in their mind. It's, I got to kill that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. that's pretty fascinating. The, St. Clair is fascinating because I hear people talk about it like that. They're like, you know, you don't want to touch the bottom sometimes when you're fishing a crankbait. <laughs> I'm just like, it goes against everything that you've been it told does. and like, as a Tennessee River, you know, guy, I'm like, you got to hit the ledge. If you don't hit the ledge, you ain't catching the fish. But that's right. That doesn't apply everywhere, you know? No, no, it doesn't. And, you know, I think part of it, too, is that here's another misconception that most a lot of guys have about crankbaits. They think a crankbait, it just it's mimicking bait fish. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that that could be furthest from the truth in some situations mm -hmm. where you're hitting that bottom. If you watch a crankbait on the bottom and it's rolling off raw, it looks exactly like a crayfish trying mm -hmm. to get away. It's bouncing. It's hitting. If you see crayfish, when they get spooked, they're taken off. They're taken off. Mm -hmm. Crankbaits mimic uh, crayfish just as much as they do baitfish. It'd be the same thing. Could be a baitfish on the bottom trying to get loose. But man, I'm telling you in the early season, early summer on say Lake Simcoe, when they get, when they come off post spawn and they get on the bottom, man, they're looking down it and they gorge on crayfish. And in mm -hmm. areas on Lake Simcoe, the bottom literally moves. I'm not, you won't, it's, it's a foot. It's, I won't see this on right. any other lake. You can, you can take a circle around your bass boat and literally could say to yourself, there's a thousand crayfish within 20 feet. If I was to draw <laughs> a circle and that's how many they're moving everywhere. So these fish gorge, I mean, you think of a crayfish, they, they come out early, like 50 degrees and they start to spawn. Their most activity is in that early season. And those fish will just, once they're finished the post spawn, they're easy because they're readily available. They gorge mm -hmm. on them. So I love bouncing crankbaits off rock, 
you know, on these flat, these rock flats, and they will mm-hmm. chase them down. You can throw a jerk bait on certain days till the cows come home. And once in a while, one will come up and hit it or look at it. But you know, when you see a bass coming up on something all the time, you know that you're pulling it up from the bottom. So they're down. Mm-hmm. As soon as you make that switch to a crankbait, it goes from follows to just one hit after the other. It's it's mm-hmm. fantastic. Right? It's, it's so funny, man, because I was out a couple of years ago with my buddy Nathan, who's watching over in the comment section. And we were fishing here on, and it was one of those things where the water was real cold, dude, like upper 40s. We knew the crawfish maybe were starting to get active around these shallow rocks. Way too cold for me normally to pick up a crankbait and normally throw a net or like a jerk bait or something. Dude, I picked up a flat side. I think I picked up a six cent 75x flat, right? So it's a flat sided square bill crankbait and just smash them, like knock their eyes out because they were just all coming up shallow. They're feeding on these crayfish. And as soon as you pick up that bait, you get that bait down in front of their face. They're all looking down and yeah. they just smash it. It goes from like struggling to just catch it. Yeah. Yep. And you kind of, you, you kind of play off that, that early, you know, down here for us, definitely something, you know, this time of year is cold. It's been extremely cold, colder than it normally is. So it's kind of delayed, but normally this time of year, I'm starting to already pick up the square bill. And, you know, again, I'm focusing on big flats. Those, you know, mostly clay, clay mud. It's going to warm up faster than most anything or uh-huh. some kind of dark rock, you know, and that's kind of what we focus on this time of year. And what I've noticed is I've even seen with my eyes where you can see fish sitting up shallow, sunning, and you hum that square bill up there and the biggest, baddest fish out of the bunch is going to be the one that literally will run off the other fish to get to that to that square bill Amazing. and it's it is it is fascinating to see it happen and like see them fighting over these square bills it's like the little fish just know like i need to stay away from that because you got this four pounder and this five pounder that are fighting over this thing and they just don't want to get near it and i mean the aggressiveness of that you know that that early pre-spawn early spring kind of deal i i think in a fish and me and ben actually talked to a biologist on my podcast a few weeks ago and we were kind of talking about this idea of as soon as that fish's metabolism hits a certain gear almost yeah. right as soon as it gets just warm enough it's like there's nothing else in its biology that it wants to do other than eat something yeah. and make babies That's and right. eating becomes comes before making babies and they right. will just destroy anything that looks like a crawdad or a bait, whatever it happens that day to be what they're feeding on. And it's, I mean, like you say, man, a square bill early season around some of these bigger, more aggressive fish, it's can make all the difference in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So on the uh, the same thing on the, uh, on the finger lakes and we go out in the spring, there's times that I've been out there for like four or five days in a row. I'll I'll just go there and stay at a hotel and fish the same lake and just see the change, right? Mm -hmm. From where the water temperature is, I walk in there and it might be in the high forties. By the time I leave, it could be in the low to mid fifties, the activity level and the amounts of fish that you will see shallow, they Mm -hmm. quadruple from the first day you were there. Maybe that first day, you know, it's more of a big fish day. It doesn't mean you won't catch them with numbers, but you know, you'll, you might only get maybe 10 or 12 bites, but almost every one's a good one, but it's Mm -hmm. a grind. You know, you're bumping into one fish here and there. And then, you know, the next day gets a little bit better. And then the next day gets a little bit better. You get that consistent weather and those fish, it's like a dinner bell, man. They just know Mm -hmm. they have to eat to get that energy because the spawn is hard on them, especially mm-hmm. you see these smallmouth, how aggressive they are on the beds. Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel so bad for them. I've been on lakes where I literally will watch boats make a run and just the fish gets caught over and over and over again. And I'm like that poor, poor bastard. I mean, I wish there was something I could do to help them out. <laughs> Large mouth are completely, it's kind of like the lazy guy that has to clean his house. Mm -hmm. Sit off to the side. Maybe you catch them or you don't, but if they don't like what's going on, they kind of just back off their bed and they're like, yeah, dude, I don't care. You can throw to that bed a (laughs) hundred times. I'm not touching it. We're small mouth. They're Uh like, man, if you put that bait in that spot one more time, I'm yeah. going to beat the crap out of that thing and I'm coming to get you. So uh-huh. it's, a it's so true. Dude. So different. It is so different. Yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. one question that we've been getting quite a bit is talking about rattles. Like during the springtime, do you have a preference on, you know, rattling bait, one knocker bait, or like, is it more so just looking at color and, and action as opposed to the sound the bait makes? Um, you know, I have both. So, and actually some of the crankbaits, like some of the lipless ones, this one here, the, uh, the vibration X comes with 
with uh, rattles or no rattles. So, you know, it really comes down to like, if I'm fishing, the other misconception I'm going to quickly say about crankbaits, everybody thinks crankbaits, you can, you should only throw them on windy days when you got wave action stuff. Some of my best crankbait days have been in flat, calm water, right? So it's just mm -hmm. about what your presentation is. So if it's really, really calm, I'll go to something that's got less of a rattle or, or no rattle if I have it. And then my col colors become a little bit more natural. I, I'll stay away from those bright, you know, chartreuses and oranges or whatever and go to kind of more bluegill or perch style, you know, maybe a little bit of uh, uh, see through, you know, where, where the sun kind of gets through it a bit on those flat, sunny, calm days. But if the wind's blowing, uh, you know, or the fish are more aggressive, I just feel like the, you know, something with rattles in it kind of triggers them. It's funny, I was throwing a jerk bait years ago and my wife was in the water filming while I was working this jerk bait. She was right under the boat. And that's listen, a dedicated wife, first of all. Yeah, sometimes, <laughs> I know, I might, somebody dedication. might call the police on me or something, but she, the first thing I noticed when I came back to do, to check the video out was how much noise that jerk bait made from the time that I started to retrieve, like on a long cast, I can hear that bait coming back. And I thought to myself, there would be a situation on a flat calm day where if I had a jerk bait that didn't have any rattles might actually be even better. You know, mm -hmm. certain days though, if they hear stuff, they want to come and check it out. Other days they, they go, they go South, they turn the other way. Right. So mm -hmm. it generally, generally, and again, there's no, it's not a, a set in stone, but when it's calm, and flat and sunny and the fish are a little spooky. I try to go more natural in my crankbaits in, in, in the, in, in the action, in the, the sound and in the color. And then if it's, if it starts getting darker or cloudy or you get some wave action, then I'll go to something that, you know, they'll see easy and they'll hear easy and come over to investigate. But so to me, the, the biggest thing is really guys will chuck a crankbait in that we talk about this chuck and wind and a crankbait. I like to work a crankbait very similar to, think of crawling a jig over the rocks, right? So I'll make a cast, get that crankbait down. And once it hits bottom, then I'm stopping. And then it's just like a slow crawl, you know, pause, crawl, speed it, stop. And you're just bumping rock. And, you know, think of a bait fish on the bottom. It's never doing the same thing. It's, ne it's not swimming like this. It's darting, it's moving around. So that bait by lifting it, popping it, moving it with your tip, reeling it, I get so many more bites that way. Uh, you know, I, I joke around with my friends who are just getting into it. I take them out and we do crankbait fishing on Lake Erie in the spring water temps start climbing up into the fifties. And you're looking at those flats in that 15 foot range. I love that X 300 and the deep six are my two favorites. I, I take a, you know, first of all, you need a long rod to cast these things. So you want to wing it as far as you can. Cause you think of that bait coming down and it hits bottom on a short cast, it's only going to hit bottom for so long before it has to start coming up. So long casts are key. But once I get it down there, I'm trying to keep it down there and I'm, I'm using a very controlled retrieve, you know, and I'll, I can move it around. So I'm not, you, you know, guys like 7.1 retrieves don't work. You need like a gear ratio of like high fours to like mid fives, even say max six, nothing higher than that, because it's hard to slow down a seven to one. You, everybody thinks, well, I could just really slow it down. You can't. It'll end up rising on you. It's just very hard to stay in contact with that bait with a faster retreat. So by going to like a 4.8, 5.5, 6.1, .5, it allows you to get that bait down, but then control it. And you got to think too, you're trying to keep that bait down there, bumping off rocks and getting a feel of A, what the bottom's like, where my best rock is to make multiple casts to. Sometimes the fish will show you, but I, I've been on rock that I've marked, even though we have all these awesome graphs now, side imaging and, you know, a lot of guys with this, you know, the forward sonars, you know, target live and all this stuff, uh, you know, you still got to be an angler and you still got to understand how to make proper casts. So getting that bait down, slowing it and really feeling like almost when I was learning crankbaits, the thing I used to do, and I know it's a little crazy, but I'd actually close my eyes and just try to feel what that bait is doing mm. on the bottom. Mm -hmm. It gives me a better picture in my head of what's going on on the bottom. And it made a better crankbait fish. I catch more fish. Now, I'm not saying every time I'm out there crankbait fishing, my eyes are closed. But I did it from time <laughs> to time to really get a good understanding of what was going on. And it, it really pays dividends. And, you know, I've seen it with other guys, you know. Confidence is a big thing, but understanding how to how to throw a crankbait and having the right equipment makes makes a big difference. Well, dude, that's so it's so true because you hear about 
uh, live scope and you hear about all these phenomenal sonars and, you know, side scan and you can see dang near everything. Yeah. But there's nothing like when you get to a spot and you're like, okay, this spot looks good. You know, you have an inside turn or you have a little hump that comes out with some rock yeah. on it. There's a spot on there that is a little bit different. And Kobe and I went out on here on one of the years where I started figuring that place out. And one of the things we did was fan casted this hump and we found the area where you get that bait and you crank it down and you just slow reel it through and you could feel that like it was just a little bit better rock and yeah. I don't know yeah. like how to explain it until you can feel it, but like right. it like bounces different or it just feels chunkier. But once you find that spot, like having the control over your crankbait and not just burning that thing back to the boat, like you can trigger bites, you can really break down an area. You can yeah. be like, okay, here I'm hitting that chunk rock. I know now there's going to be a little sand patch and then it's going to come back into the chunk rock. When That's I hit right. the sand, I got to slow my retriever. I got to like kill it. Yes. Let it come up. Yeah. But you won't, you don't get that unless you are that in tune with what your crankbait's doing. You don't just cast and reel that thing as, as fast as you can back to the boat. No. You know, like, yeah. 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 And like I tell people all the time, and they ask me questions because I'll, I'll take guys fishing with me, and especially when we're crankbait fishing, and it's constantly, hey, I'm hung up. Hey, I'm hung up. Hey, I'm hung up. You know, how do you get that thing through that tree? Or what? It's like, and I always tell people, I'm like, I've thrown this crankbait tens of thousands of times. I know exactly what it's supposed to feel like when yeah. I run up to a piece of, you know, wood, whether I run up to a piece of grass, whatever that feels like, I know that feeling. And it's like, so as soon as it's doing something that I'm not sure what it is, that's either a sign to me that I need to slow down and try to figure out what that is and go yeah. back and look at that. Or there's something on it, or there's a fish that's ate it weird or whatever it is. But like people, you know, I, I tell people all the time, like there's certain baits. I'm not this way with every bait, but there's definitely certain baits, especially crank baits and a lot of more reactionary style baits for me. I know exactly what that bait should feel like, what it should be doing. And when I'm fishing any given set of conditions, bottom composition, whatever it is, I know exactly what that should feel like. Yeah. And I think that is, like you say, man, you can have every graph in the world. I mean, you know, great example of this. I had a buddy win a tournament this past weekend. He had the live scope on his boat. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, even though I could see those fish, man, I had to know how the bait worked to be able to get those fish yeah. to re actually react to it. He said, cause it was several times that I realized that I was getting that bait down to them and putting it in their face, but then I wasn't working it right because I was more focused on trying to watch them eat it. That's right. He said, yeah. it, he said, and then when I kind of made that mental adjustment, like, Oh, I still got to work the bait, how it's supposed to be worked. <laughs> he started catching the fish and he won the tournament. So you're yeah. right, man. That's huge. Yeah. It, you know what? They're, they're obviously look, their age. I don't, I don't honestly, I'm not, I can't listen. We all, if you're in a tournament, you got to compete. You, there's mm -hmm. no question about it. And it, again, guys that there are certain situations where that forward sonar, that live scope or the tar live target, mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's amazing. And I mean, not having it definitely puts you in the backseat. You're going to miss fish or by the time you actually find them, they're under the boat, they might be spooked or whatever, mm -hmm. but you still got it. You still got to, you still got to catch them. And I, I just think like, especially like I get a lot of younger guys on the boat. And the first thing I tell them, man, Listen, it's great. These guys coming up with all these technical, you know, they grew up holding a cell phone and computers and mm -hmm. they so tuned with their graphs. And that's great. I'm like, man, that that's a huge thing to know, but you still got to know how to catch them. You still got to understand what your setup is. You just can't grab any rod and throw a bait on it and cat all these rods. It's just like, it, and I know we use it all the time. The analogy of like using tools, you can't, you can't hammer a nail in wood with a screwdriver, right? So mm -hmm. understanding your setup from the rod to the line to the reel makes a big deal. And then having the confidence, knowing how to retrieve that bait, knowing how to get fish to bite it. If you can get all that together, yeah, then you're an angler. You know what I mean? But just mm -hmm. being good at one thing is not, you know, it's not the way to go. And I, I, I just feel like the, the art of angling is kind of changed a bit, right? Because mm -hmm. all these electronics yeah, help anglers now before of trying to find stuff think of back mm -hmm. in the days trying to find them on 2d sonar rocks mm -hmm. and what a brush pile looked like in 2d sonar like yeah. i don't know what and that lining is. up with yeah. you know one of the things yeah, that my yeah. dad, he like my dad taught me he's like 
You see that yellow house? You see that tree? You see that bridge pile on? Cast in between that bridge pile and that tree at that little tree with the pink flowers on it. You know what I mean? We're out there humming these like man's 30 pluses. You know, I'm I'm in the back of the boat, my arms sore. You know, we're on these old glass rods that weigh 600 pounds. And we're down there, you know, cranking these crankbaits down. And like, I tell people all the time, man, like the art of just going fishing. Yeah. And just go like... There's a lot of tournaments, man. You know, I, I I have a boat and, you know, I boat fish, but a lot of the tournaments I fish in are kayak tournaments. And right. I did it for the simple fact of, well, n- number one, I love it. But number two, I can just show up and fish. Like, it's like yeah. it's so stripped down and so almost rudimentary that I'm like, they're like, you got a plan? I'm like, nope, I'm going to show up and go fishing. <laughs> and they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm going to show up. I'm going to look at the weather. I'm going to look at the water. And I'm going to go fishing and see what we That's can right. do. And I, I love, love that. I love that. I love that yeah. there's still guys out there that's like, man, it's not this graph, this graph, and this. It's like, no, we gotta go fishing and we're gonna figure this out, you know? I love that. So, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, and, and that's one of the cool things about the seminar style, right? Because I was trying to do these in like 12 minute videos and break down everything you could possibly think of about crankbaits. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like we're trying to talk about the when and the where and whatever. It's so variable. Where, like you said, Nick, man, like there could be a calm day where these fish are starting to push up shallow and you can now take a silent square bill and catch them. Or you're talking in the fall time and those fish are starting to push off into the 15 foot break. Right. Yeah. And so it's so variable. And, and as much as we want to say, okay, these are the absolutes and this is when you should be throwing a crankbait and this is technically when you should be doing this, you almost just need to like spend the time understanding fish movements and fish behavior and a crankbait is really just another tool to like pick them off of certain types of cover right because a crankbait is so versatile you have a lip list you have square bills you have medium divers deep divers yeah so you can basically reach them in any water column any time of year as long as you're able to understand how these fish set up on it and understand how to make your bait do what it needs to do to trigger these fish to bite that's right yeah yeah for sure yeah i mean uh you know, I had a customer on the boat and he was telling me, look, Nick, I just want one crankbait rod that does everything. What it is, what is it? And I'm like, if you can find mm-hmm. one, let me know because there's yeah. no such thing. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like what you would throw a deep six, you know, you're talking about a three quarter ounce crankbait that gets down to 20 feet or now the new, the big M's 7.5. It, you know, it's a horse of a bait. You can't chuck that on a seven foot rod. You, you have no leverage. You're going to have no feel, no control. That rod is just not meant more than likely you're going to snap it trying to cast it. Right. Mm-hmm. I had a guy come in with one of these big crankbaits. He's like, you know, I, I'm just using my pitching stick. And I'm like, you can't use a pitching stick for a crankbait. It's too yeah, stiff. Yeah. He goes, yeah, but I, I need to throw this bigger crankbait. I'm like, I, I understand, but you need a more parabolic rod. You need that bend to get the bait out there, first of all, and then to actually control it when it's down there. You need a longer rod. So you're deep diving. You can get two, maybe two rods can work, right? But you need that one big rod to deal with all your bigger crankbaits, your your X, your X your X6s or whatever, deep sixes, uh, you know, anything, they, they all, every manufacturer makes some sort of deep diving crankbait. You need that longer rod. Uh, and then, you know, you're throwing your square bills, you know, some of your medium divers, maybe you get away with the seven, seven, two, you know, if I'm target fishing, I like a shorter rod. It's more accurate. You know, I give, I can allow to more flip cast and get real accurate when I'm trying to get to the edge of that dock or around that log or that boulder on shore. But you know, when I'm fishing big crankbaits, target fishing isn't really, yeah, you're fishing a line, but if you're off a bit, it's not the end of the world. But if you're off a bit on a dock, it's mm-hmm. a big deal because you, mm-hmm. you're yeah, going to end up in this guy's pontoon. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the guy's not going to be too happy about yeah. it either. So, uh, <laughs> exactly. yeah, but, yeah, all that makes a difference. And, and, it, and it helps you with, with feel and, you know, kind of getting uh, adjusted to what it's supposed to feel like, how you're supposed to work it, get used to casting it, all that stuff. So I've never seen a guy in Tennessee throw deep diving crankbait with seven foot rod. I mean, it just doesn't no, matter. It does. No, man. And that's like <laughs> a lot of people, you know, they'll ask me, you know, cause we throw the bit, I mean, just like you guys, you know, we'll get the 10 XDs and these, you know, these giant, these giant crankbaits out. And like a lot of people think that, you know, my seven foot medium, like that I throw my three XDs and my 1.5s and, you know, 
all those kinds of things on. And even within that category, yeah, I have two rods that are labeled exactly the same. They're for two totally different purposes, just right. because the, you know, percentage of materials in each rod. And I actually did a video about it. It came out tonight. I kind of talked about oh, how cool. hyper specific I am when it comes to certain rods and reels, just because that's what I found to be the best for me. Right. But dude, like those 10 XDs, man, you got to have a special rod to throw those things because they're almost two and a half ounces. And you're right, right, man. You go to, if you go and really, I mean, get after that bait and go to throw it and snap that <laughs> rod and, and like really get that whip lashing action. Yeah. All it's going to do is that two and a half ounces is going to snap the tip Boom. right off. That that's thing. exactly right. It's too much you know? load. Yeah. It's way too much load. And so yeah. that's why you start looking at those 7-Eleven, those eight foot long, big glass composite rods, but they got, a, you know, they're a heavy action, but yeah. they're mostly glass. So they're very parabolic that's and right. people, it's so huge. I tell people all the time and, and I'm sure you, you would concur with this. Like people are like, man, I'll lose so many fish on crankbaits. I don't have confidence in them. I'm getting tons of bites. And so that tells me, they're in the right spots. They're doing the right things. And I'm yeah. like, what kind of rod are you throwing it on? And they're like, oh, you know, just my my jig rod, you know. And I'm like, boom, there's your problem, man. I was yeah. like, you know, I was like glass composite rods, you know, those composite glass rods, anything that has a blend, something that's more parabolic, something that has more yeah. glass in it. I said, that is literally to the detriment of the entire process. That's that's, right. that's it right there. Like that's yeah. what will break the camel's back every single time if you don't got the right rod the right reel and the right line. Those absolutely. There's not very many things in the fishing world I would say that about because I'm a I'm a generalist. Like I, I I'm I like to have rods that do a lot of things, and I'm just because yeah. I know the people I'm talking to they may not have two thousand three thousand dollars at disposal to buy stuff. But what I tell them all the time like crank baits and jerk baits. I was like those are the two. Yeah. If I was going to get real freaking specific about something and spend some money on it. Yeah. Spend the money on those two things because you've got to have the right gear to be as successful as you can. Yeah, you're absolutely right, man. And you know what? Even if you think like, just think of a crankbait rod that's too stiff and that baits down the bottom. You see a large mall. A lot of times they'll attack it, but other times they'll try and suck it in. They'll use that vacuum. Mm -hmm. And if that mm -hmm. tip's too stiff, if your line, a lot of guys will throw braid, straight braid on, on mm -hmm. a heavier rod. It, that fish can't suck it in. So when it, it, when it grabs it, it might only get that one hook. But mm -hmm. honestly, like crankbaits, they're treble hooks, but you will most of the time, if you got the right setup, you will get most of your fish to the boat. You exactly. won't lose anywhere near as many. Jerkbait, you know, for smallmouth, yeah, no matter, you know, your setup's important. There's no question about it. I talk about setup. I stress setup. But no matter how good the setup is, you're still going to lose fish, it's particularly mm -hmm. smallmouth. On a jerkbait, they're mm -hmm. small treble hooks. There's three of them. They play against one another. Mm -hmm. they, they have a harder mouth. But when I'm throwing crankbaits for smallmouth, my catch to my, my hook to boat ratio is super high. It's in the nineties. I mean, you just don't lose as many. Yeah. If exactly. you've got the right setup. Exactly. If you've got the right setup. So talk yeah. about that. You know, I, I know, I think we both know what we look for, right? You know, you're looking yeah. for those composite rods is what is your crankbait setup look like for, you know, your smaller body 1.5 style crankbaits, like rod real line. What's that look like for you? Yeah. yeah. Start to talk through like the, your rods for all these different setups. Start with like, square bills yeah maybe talk about lipless and then go into like your medium divers and your deep divers yeah yeah sure so my my lipless crankbait the two the two rods i like the most that mega bass in the double x has one called a swing fire it's seven two uh you know again more glass in that one like i don't want to say 50 but it's probably 40 percent in that range 40 35 so very parabolic really light tip allows for easy casting but again a lot of bend but you know down that once you get past that mid section it starts to stiffen up so you got to remember up here we got a lot of wheat so we I, I, I always suggest never go too parabolic because a you start losing a little sense of what the bot you know what you're hitting and a lot of times if you go to like you know high glass rods by the time you realize you're in the weeds it's too late that little bit more sensitive rod gives you feel and you start feeling your rod and with a quick snap, you, you, you're able to feel it. And now you have a little bit of the power in the butt to get that bait, to free it off, off, off weeds. A lot of times when I'm in weed and I give it a quick snap, that's when you get bit that mm -hmm. reaction of that bait taken off to the side and running through weeds, those fish will come and hit it. If it's stuck with weeds, you know, that, that retrieve is pretty much wasted. So that, I really love that one. There was another one that they made, man. And they, I didn't make it anymore. 
and you know, it doesn't make sense for me to talk about it, but I'm going to talk about it anyways. It was called a fast moving special. It was a six ten, and again, it was higher end on the graphite side. I'm on the uh, sorry on the uh, glass side. Man, I love that rod for like small to medium crankbaits, square bills. You know, the one point fives. It was short, so it allowed me to really loop cast, keep the bait low if I'm trying to get under docks or around trees. It, 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 you could finesse that bait through anything. It had the power, but it had that nice flex, and every fish just seemed to be stuck when you got them. Those were my two go-tos. Now that I still have, like I, I actually got a couple more from the factory when they were out. I said, yeah, I really like that. They're like, yeah, sure. You know, and they sent it to me. But yeah. the flat side is another one I really like. It's a seven foot and it comes in the Levante as well as the double X. Uh, I love, I love that stick as well. Seven foot again, very parabolic down the middle allows me to catch even up to a medium diving crankbait, like those 10 foot, like the X two hundreds, uh, you know, I love it on that bait, on that, on that rod. The other one that I don't know what it is, but I, I really love it on that. Um, the 110, I'm trying to think now, cause there's so many of them. The, the destroyer, I think it's called the 110, 110 special. Is that and the, it, that's the spinning rod, right? That, no, it's bait caster, but it oh, is right. the, it's a jerk bait rod. Mm. So it's 611. Mm -hmm. Again, I love that for yeah. square bills and stuff. Still has that really nice, soft belly on it. A little bit more butt in power in the butt. So again, square bills. When I start getting th those are my rods and, and the line, the reels, it depends in the summertime. I may go to a seven to one. If I'm fishing over flats, a lot of times with these S cranks, because they have that kind of, you know, wobble that'll kind of kick off to the left or to the right because of their pointed nose, there pushes water one way or the other, especially when you're burning them pretty quick. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I love it on, I, I I'll go to a little bit faster. The rod pretty much stays the same. I may bounce up to, um, the old FMJ, uh, not FMJs, the, uh, it's a seven, five, five and a half or five, I think it was a five F five seventy. So I use that for, you know, swim baits and deeper water. And I also liked it for my lipless baits or when I'm fishing over flats a little bit longer, allows me to cast that bait out mm -hmm. farther. The new one is actually even better. Uh, if I'm going to, I can't remember, but I'll get that before, before we end here, I'll, I have it here, but it, it's actually a little bit softer than the older model. It's even better for, it actually becomes more of a crankbait rod. So I love that in open water, big flats. I use that, but generally my crankbaits, I'm going to like my Tatula 6.3, or I have the Ryuga in the Daiwa in a five, I think it's a 5.8 or a 5.5. Those mm -hmm. are my, that becomes my sort of bigger crankbait when I get into the, um, thing but i i really love just the 6.3 in the uh tatulas you know the price is right they're kind of my workhorse reels i use them whether you know i have a 6.3 a 7.3 and then an 8.3 when i get in to faster one but my 6.3 is my go-to on my cranks on both those rods it balances out uh, out nicely uh line again it depends on cover so if i'm fishing more wood and trees and stuff like that i may go up to 12 or 14 i may even go higher if if I'm trying to get that bait to stay up a bit more and I don't want it to dive as deep. So it's a little shallower. I don't want to dig it into stuff as much. Then I'll go to heavier line, but sort of everyday general, general, like 12 pound test in the springtime yeah. throwing, throwing, if I'm fishing more around wood, I might go up to 14, but if I'm 14, then I may go to like a 2.0 S crank instead of the 1.5. I just find that 14 is almost too heavy for that, that, that mm -hmm. bait. It kind of mm -hmm. over, it doesn't allow the bait to do what it wants to do. It ends up pulling it a bit. You mm -hmm. kind of lose the feel, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, when I get into my medium cranks, again, it goes back to the, you know what? It's going to drive me mental. So, <laughs> Is it this EMFT 7.5? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, the 7.5. Seven, seven uh, is it a, is it a 4.5? I think it's an F 4.5 or F five. I'm not sure. Someone hunting bass said it's EMFT seven. That's exactly five. right. Yeah. And I think it's a 5.0 because the Braillist is the next one up. It's a seven five, but it's a, uh, I think it's a 5.5. And that's the power you're talking, right? That's so power, it's like a, yeah. it's like a medium, it like a medium, medium ish, about a medium ish. Yeah. Pretty much yeah. medium. I wouldn't say medium heavy medium, okay. medium rod, but again, Really nice parabolic. It, it, it again, it's got butt, but it allows me to make long casts with that. So I love that bait that rod for like my lipless when I get into my half ounce, three quarter. Again, you don't want a rod that if I'm making long casts and generally with lipless, generally I'm casting it over deep flats and stuff like that, weed flats, rock flats. 
I want a distance cast. If I'm throwing a seven foot rod, it's hard to get leverage and hooks on a fish from a long distance. So I need that longer rod. That seven five is perfect mm -hmm. for this. And it's also really good for the X 300. So deep, this is like a 12 to 15 foot, uh, anything in that range, uh, you know, half ounce bait. It's perfect for that. Another when, thing in, in really clear water, I want to add on to this. So in, in yeah. clear water, go to a longer rod. I, I go to a seven four uh, composite uh, TFO cranking rod, brand new right. rod, right? But you get a lot longer casts. And the other yeah. thing is when I'm fishing a bait that's actually moving quite a bit, like not one that I'm too worried about, like kind of getting through yeah. and really want to feel everything. Having that composite rod, a 60, 40 um, graphite to glass. Yeah. It lets that fish get that bait a little bit. Yeah, so for lipless right. crankbaits, for that um, medium diving crankbait, like a 10 or 12 to 15 foot diver, like this Blitz or yeah. your Dredger 14.5s, like it just lets these fish get that bait a little bit right. before I actually feel them, especially when it's at the end of a long cast or I'm kind of that's moving right. that bait pretty quick. So that's another thing to consider is how you're fishing the bait and matching mm -hmm. your gear to that as well. And I know that's something like um, that's really, really critical that, it's going to help you land a lot more fish. Well, you know, what's funny, Ben, is like playing off what both of y'all said is I use a longer rod, obviously, to get that longer cast, like with a lipless. But down here, you know, Tennessee River System, there's times in the spring when these fish are so freaking shallow yeah. that they'll literally run up and push their body out of the water to eat bait fish. And I've had times where I'm throwing these, you know, these liplesses into places I can't even get my boat and literally holding my reel in my face and reeling it. And that <laughs> length helps me to get that thing up there and yeah. hold it up just yeah. far enough yeah. off the bottom and then yeah. load up and help me to get those fish out of there. And it's kind of funny to hear, you know, both of y'all talk about that. And then I'm sitting here thinking, man, I use the link for the simple fact of I'm fishing in water this deep sometimes. <laughs> and there's yeah, five pounders right. sitting up there right. eating gizzard shad. You know what I mean? Right. So it's, that's cool. It's kind of cool to all hear, Everybody talk about why they use a longer rod for whatever particular situation they're in, but it's all kind of that same train of thought. And like, right. man, when you were, when you were talking shallow cranking, the thing that came to my mind is like this extension of your arm, right? Like if you were to throw a baseball, you're going to be a lot more accurate if you like are just throwing it off your hand than if you are throwing it off of a long pole, right? right? So like having a shorter rod, I would not recommend going to like a, anything longer than like a seven, two, if you throw in a square wheel, that's because right. Because you need to be accurate. And so the longer the rod, the less connected you are to that bait. That's right. So like, I'll even go down to a six, nine, a six, uh, they have the six, nine, yeah. they call it like a medium heavy, but it's really soft. Yeah. But you can be so accurate and you can kind of put that bait exactly where you want it because it's basically like you're just throwing it up there. And then you have so much control over every, like if you move your body, that bait moves, like there's no mm -hmm. delay. Yeah, it's right. a little bit softer, but like you can really feel everything these the bait does when you're that connected to it. Whereas at the end of a long cast, man, like I want to be able to feel the bait, but yeah. I don't need to be able to get it to move like right now. That's if right. it moves in two, four seconds, I'm, I'm good with that because I'm not trying to hit like the edge of a dot post or get it to hit the dot post and come around it and then come back around the dot post. You know, so that's another thing. Like there's so many factors, but at the end of the day, I think, the biggest overall takeaway is start with a shorter rod. If you want to be close target casting, Yeah. the further away you are, you might want to go to like, you still need to have the power and the backbone, but if you want to make a long cast with a moving bait, have something that lets the fish get the bait, but also gives you leverage where you can really drive the hooks home and get that fish to the boat. That's right. right. Yeah. Yeah. It gives you control from a distance away. It gives you the length cast. It gives you the control when you get the bait down far away. And then it gives you the leverage to get good hook sets and then control that fish when you're fighting it. If you don't have that, yeah, yeah, then, then it, it's going to equal to no feel loss of fish. You know, all these things c will compile up. Right. So mm -hmm. we get into the, the bigger stuff. You know, my go-to is the, is the launcher. It's a seven 11 and a double X. I love that. The older version to me, it was a little bit lighter. I think it, you went up to one ounce, the newer version, they made it a little bit beefier. You can get up to, I believe a 1.4. So even the M sevens, there's, they're starting to scratch that 7.5 again to snap cast it. No, mm -hmm. I, I haven't tried it, but I would assume that rod's going to break. It's really starting to get to that end mm -hmm. of its rope there of how but that rod's got super really nice parabolic but a lot of power down that back end so when you get to about you know this point that 45 degree those hooks go in you know mm -hmm. so it gives me control it gives me le length 
I'm casting that on anywhere from 10 to 14 pound test. That M 7.5 is almost like it's a 14 pound test. It's a, it's a big bait, man. And mm -hmm. I've tried to 12 and it, you can get away with it, but you almost got to like, you know, kind of <laughs> loop, be a little bit careful, you know, the loop cast and let the wind take it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's really nothing cool. like just absolutely just rearing up on one and going <laughs> and it just, <laughs> and the thing flies into like the next County too. Oh, every gone. single yeah. time. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've done that because I'm a so when I crank, especially deep cranking, you know, when I'm shallow water cranking and, you know, doing stuff, you know, that's a little bit shallower, I'm fluorocarbon all the way. And yeah. on the big deep crankbaits, I start moving into copolymers just because, right. you know, it's whale rope, you know. Yeah. And so I can get away with like a 10 pound, which is about equivalent to a 12 to 14 pound, you know, fluorocarbon. Right. And man... I can't tell you how many times I've reared up on a 10 XD and I mean, just <laughs> tack, and there it goes. And you're like, well, all righty then. I guess that one's going into the next County, dude. Those things, they fly. I mean, they will fly. So, dude, uh, you know, the first time I had one of those, uh, a big M 7.5s. I was, I just wanted to play around with it. You, you know, it wasn't the right time. I wasn't on the right lake, but I'm like, I'm going to try this out. But I had it on, on the old, uh, uh, launcher. Cause I had my, my deep six on it and I had, uh, I, it was 12 pound test. So whatever. So, you know, I take some pictures of it. I'm going to play around with this. I get in the back of the boat, literally first cast all my buddy hears. And I'm just like, and there it goes. <laughs> Yep, this boom, snap, gone. And yeah, I'm like, yeah. ah, maybe I'm gonna try with 14 pound and bring my other stick the next time yeah, I play yeah. around with you. Dude, That's and that awesome. fluorocarbon doesn't just break, it's oh, like it, a gunshot when it's it like blows. Like that. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> just gone, dude. It, it, it's yeah. kind of spooks you because your line just like literally I use a sunline quite a bit. It yeah. like just poof, like disintegrates. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you think yeah. you got shot. You're checking your body. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. One of the funniest things that ever happened, this is with a different rod company that I don't work with anymore. Neither here nor there. Good good company. Just yeah. whatever. Yeah. Alex and I were fishing oh, Tennessee. God. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he hands uh, me this bandit. So you really got to cast this thing. Like You got to really whip this bait. Yeah. I come back with it and it goes, which and I come forward, it goes boom bang. And Alex goes, My god, who's shooting at us? And I'm like, Dude, my god, it, it snapped in my four spots. Oh man, <laughs> oh, that's great, that's oh. great, dude. So, tell me about that big M. I, I've been yeah. looking at them kind of playing around. You know, I, I throw a bunch of different deep divers, yeah. it's, it's the thing we do down here in the summer, you know, yeah. late, yeah, late spring, early summer. It's huge, Tennessee River system. Um, so like the, the big M. Um, you know, what, what is like, is the function of that bait designed for like deep summer fishing or is yeah. that kind of what the whole design around I, that bait was? I think that design was strictly meant for it. Like when I'm thinking about it, I'm thinking exactly where you are, Tennessee, yeah. right? Yeah. So big, it has a really nice roll to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it up, up here there, there, I mean, I'm telling you there, there'll be some situations here where it would work. Uh, for both largemouth and smallmouth. But, you know, the thing about our Great Lakes, it's not easy getting a crankbait bite on the other lakes once summer comes in. You know, mm. yeah, in, this, in the spring there's some opportunities, but it, Lake Ontario gets so clear, so mm. clear. And, I, you know, they, the fish just react to it they, for whatever reason. And I don't know, maybe somebody has figured it out and been able to pattern it, but I've never been able to pattern smallmouth on Lake Ontario with a crankbait. I've had days on it. It's ridiculous. Actually, a buddy of mine, <laughs> he was throwing a crankbait on Lake Ontario and he had, he was reeling this one in. And I guess it was a super slow float. And he went to, to he put the rod down to go get something. And his rod took off. Some fish went and grabbed it. It was like a five pound smallmouth. Oh, God. It, while it was sitting in the water, just slowly rising on its own. And he said that day he caught like about 10 of them on him. But I've had like a couple of good days that I can tell you, man, it, they would crush it. And mm -hmm. then you think you're on to something and then you realize you're on to nothing. The mm -hmm. next 10 times with the same typical conditions, who knows what the reason was, you know, why they're on about it is, it's been a struggle, but that big M that 7.5 to me, man, if I was in Tennessee, I'd be bringing my entire box and playing around with that. I think, yes. I think that that bait would be fantastic down there. I, I hope maybe one day you can tell me that it is or not. It would just be. Yeah. And see, the reason it sparked my interest so much is because these fish down here, 
you know, they're getting more and more pressure than ever before. I yeah. mean, our, our lakes are getting hammered, especially with the virus and everything. I mean, the pressure this past year was phenomenal. On these Everybody's lakes. rich now. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And so, like, what I started to notice is I was having to experiment with crankbaits that go deeper than anything that I've got in my box, you know? Ooh like drilling out 10 XDs and putting lead in the bill, getting yeah. out the old 30 pluses and, you know, long line in them and doing stuff like that. Yeah. And so when I saw that crankbait, I thought, well, this is going to give me a couple things. It gives me a crankbait that gets down there where they live, you know, that 25 to 30 foot range, but it also gives me something they've probably never seen. And, right. you know, a couple years ago, that was the duo Realis, the 20A, you know, that was, that was, or 25A or whatever the deep, the deep diver was, that was that bait. And like, man, like I was going behind guys and catching them where those dudes were throwing three XDs and the six cents and your repals and everything they'd seen. Yeah. You go in there with a duo and they catch them. Well, then everybody kind of got wind of that and it went away. And now I'm thinking, well, maybe this mega bass, this, this M yeah. is going to be the deal. You know, there's something that interests me and mega bass, a lot of what they do, you know, even though I don't work with mega bass and I, I tell people this all the time, you know, I work with loose and I use loose rods and reels. Yeah. But I don't work with a specific bait company for the simple fact of I like it all. Like yeah. I want to touch everything and, and be and, and try everything because Mega Bass may have a little gym here that I'll yeah. be able to yeah. just, you know, hammer them on. Yeah, it so. gets deep. Like that's a 20, that's an easy 25 foot bait. I know Chris Aldane said he gets it down to 25 feet, but it's also got a different shape. It almost looks mm -hmm. like a shad more, more than any. It doesn't have that typical roll mm -hmm. on the, on the body. So, um, it, I, man, it, I would love to stay in contact with you just to see what, what your, what your experience is. If you get one out there and play around with it, I've played around with it very little here. And then I ended up breaking my wrist late in the year. So that took care of any kind of, uh, you know, crank based or anything. I, I couldn't even throw a drop shot on that, round, yeah. on that yeah. hand for crying out loud. But, um, yeah, we, there's a specific tournament we do up here. Um, that I thought that that, that 7.5 would be really good. And, you know, just for whatever reason, they just were not in deep. Yeah. Those large mouth yeah. were up shallower. And I, I was so jacked up. I had all these crankbait rods because the year before we'd, we'd been in the top five doing just that. And I thought, man, we're going to crush them. And then, yeah. of course, they're just on a completely different other thing. And then we're in two feet of water pitching jigs. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't make the fish do what you want them to do. You do what the fish want you to do. So Exactly. So so tell me something, because me and Ben have talked about this, and we kind of yeah. talked about deep cranking, right? Yeah. Um, down here in the summer, like one thing about deep cranking is, you know, obviously just like anything else, you got to kind of let the fish tell you what they want. Right. But there's a time period down here where the – that you literally can't, you can't crank it fast enough. Like, I don't know what yeah. it is about them. Yeah. Like you literally, the faster that you can get that thing going, the more it, they almost seem to get bigger, the faster you can get it, but we're still fishing, you know, five, one gear ratio yeah. reels yeah. just cause that's, you got to have that torque, you know? Right. So right. is there, I know Ben's kind of talked about, you know, some of the stuff he does in the fall. Is there a time period for that up there that it's just like speed or the small mouth always just kind of want it just a little bit slower? No, you know what? I I I was think I didn't know if I wanted to talk about this, but we're gonna be talking <laughs> about it now. So we might as well talk about it. So speed is a big thing with smallmouth. And so in these lakes where you feel like you can't get bit because it's too clear and they don't mm -hmm. wanna, you know, you're they're seeing too much hardware, mm -hmm. speed changes that, right? Mm -hmm. So that really aggressive, reel it as fast as you can, mm -hmm. banging off stuff like you, you you don't stop it, you just keep going. They hit it like a freight train. It's like yeah. you don't know. Sometimes you're snagged and mm -hmm. sometimes it's a fish, but you don't know until you pull back. Yep. And either that rod is like, no, I'm stuck or, yep. oh, I got one. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. But speed, a lot of guys don't do it. They Again, they we talked about this earlier about how, mm -hmm. you know, I love crawling in on rock and stuff like that. But late in the summer and into that early fall, burning a crankbait yes. for smallmouth is deadly. Yes. It's deadly. Yes. Yeah. Speed, you're absolutely 100% right. And yeah, that's really it, where that's really where even on like Huron, where normally you are typically banging it off stuff on the bottom, cr like crushing bottom. Like yeah. that's where I notice you can fish it up in the column and like maybe hit the top of a boulder or maybe come across like a one patch of grass, rip it out and you're ruined, right? But like yeah. that to me, that I guess early October to like mid or end of October bite when that water's still in the fifty upper fifty degree range, like that's when I'm fishing it fast. And then yeah. When it starts to cool down, those fish don't get off a of crankbait. I'm going to tell no. you they don't get off crankbait. No, no, they don't. 
you just slow it down or you adjust your crankbait and you can catch them. But um, that, like you said, man, that fall, like early fall bite is really when like killing a crankbait as fast as you can gets a lot of bites. So that's one thing that my buddy Ron and I did last early last fall. We were fishing a crankbait in like six foot of water and we were crushing bottom, but it was a matter of you reel that thing as fast as you can get it through there. And as soon as it hits something, it changes direction and you go to pick it back up because you lost contact. There's just a fish on it. Like it's crazy. You know, a few years ago, I, I won a tournament on a, on an inland lake here uh, called rice Lake. A lot of guys know here. It's a, yep. it's a mesotrophic lake. It's, it's, it's very, it's, it's got a lot of sediment in it, but mm-hmm. the middle of the lake, there's all these rock piles here and there, you know, wherever you can find them, uh, you know, around the channel and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I ended up winning that tournament on a deep six fishing in 10, eight to 12 feet of water with a bait that dives down to 18. Mm-hmm. But what I found is that on that particular tournament, it was very calm throughout the week. I went out there, I had a four day pre-fish and I was consistently getting bit on it. And what I found is that they wanted that bait. If you were to just crawl it over the bottom, you wouldn't get bit. They wanted that bait to crash into the rock and then really just aggressively bump. And then what would happen is, so it was a, it was a pro-am, the, the kid I had in the boat with me on day two. So he was sitting in second, Corey Johnson was in first. And I told the kid, I said, listen, I got these two setups. I said, when I get, when I get a fish, I, I need you to take that other rod, take the hook off and just lay it in the water and grab the net, right? So it would fire the school up. So it was flat calm. It was just not crankbait weather at all. So, you know, I'm on this spot and I'm casting, I'm making about, I probably made about a dozen casts and nothing out, but it was right. The bait fish were down there. I could see this pod of small perch that were just off the bottom. Like it's going to go, it's going to go. So I'm going around. It's tiny rock pile. I, I mark a fish and I'm like, okay, it's on. Right. So I backed off. I backed off. I made a long cast onto the rock and I'm like, okay, it's going to happen. And I mean, just as I said it, bonk, I get one. He, this kid is so good. He goes down, he grabs my rod, he puts it down, he lays it in the water off to the side, gets the net, comes over, nets the fish, puts in the, I grab the next rod, make another cast, got another one. So he's taking that fish off the hook, trying to get it in the live well to get the net ready. I had my entire weight in probably 20 minutes. Uh, there was one fish I called maybe about a half an hour later. That was a four pounder. And then I ended up winning the tournament with just under 20 pounds that day on a day that they just should not have been hitting jerk. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, crankbaits, but everybody's drop shotting tubing. And I just went in there and that crashing of in that yeah. rock just yep. triggered bites. It was, uh, it was a yeah. lot of fun. Yeah. That's so awesome, I, really to, I really wanted to talk about changing the profile of the crankbait, depending on water clarity. Yeah. This is something that I've seen quite happen a, a decent bit up here. Like we talk about clear water, crankbaits can kind of shut off, especially in the summertime, mm-hmm. right? It can get harder to get bit. But one of the things that I noticed is as you push into the fall and those fish don't get off crankbait, a lot of times you notice like very fluctuating water color. So yeah. where one day they might eat uh, a more translucent, smaller body, um, more typical crankbait size. Then the next day the water clarity gets all crazy and you switch up to like a big, big, big body bait. You know, these are two totally different baits, a small Domeki and a big old six cents, 300 DV dives 15 foot, both of them. Yeah. But this bait just starts to play when that water clarity changes have you noticed that around you like switching up to like bigger body or more hard wobbling crankbaits when you notice water clarity change yeah no doubt you know when the water's super clear i mean then you know i start getting into my like i have a couple of uh dd griffins small crankbait and it only gets down maybe seven eight feet but i just find that that smaller you know i'm looking for areas that i have in that depth trying to get down deeper you know, when you're looking at 15 feet, most of my crankbaits that are 15 feet are the, you know, either the, the X, the X 300 or the deep six, but je- really, even though they're deep diving, they're actually pretty small profile yeah. crankbaits compared to some other ones. They're not so, but then I'll go to this translucent, like that, get like that gill perch. It, it has some shine on it now, but you could see it on a sunny day. The sun would yeah. just, so I'm looking for something where mm-hmm. fish can, can hear it. They see it. But it's almost like in and out of their sight. You know, it's not like something like a bright chartreuse, you know. So I almost start to switch colors when I get into that mode. I go to more translucent colors. You know, I, I'll lighten up my line. I'll go to maybe 10-pound test instead of, say, 12 or 14. 
And then, you know, I'm really trying to keep that steady and get it down. I don't try, I don't want too much erratic action going on. And in that calm water or clear water, I get a bit more on cloudy days or windy days. Then I start looking at, you know, being more aggressive with my retrieves. I go to more bright chartreuses, oranges, something really bright in those dark days that'll trigger those fish to eat it. You know, something that they can see a little bit easier, but the wind plays a big role on that and, and conditions, right? Sky conditions. So let's start to list off like some of your favorite crankbaits. Tons of questions coming in. Guys coming in asking about the Griffin. Um, guys coming in talking about the Sonic side and other crankbaits. Start to kind of run through like when you choose which crankbaits. Like when does the Sonic side play versus the S crank versus you know? Yeah, and Ben, you just that. asked maybe, him the most some... open ended question. No, I did, just... I did because I did. <laughs> That's because... a whole other seminar. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like hold on just a second. <laughs> But like, but like, uh, just kind of talk through yeah, some of your yeah, favorite crankbaits yeah. and maybe give one or two of your favorite colors. Sure, um, sure, sure, yeah, yeah. So you know, when it comes to my 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 two um, square bills, the S crank and the Sonic side, I love the Sonic side when the water's super cold. So those cold, cold, early in the season, it has a very tight wobble. I really love this Sonic side. Now, again, you know, cold cold water is relative because it could still if you have it's that first first move of fish coming up is when I really love the sonic side. Doesn't mean I can't catch them in the summertime. I do again, it cold front conditions when I want a tighter wobble, you know, maybe in clear, clear water. I don't want that big wide wobble. I go to the sonic side, the S crank. I like when that water starts to warm up, it's got a wider wobble. Uh, you know, when the water starts to get into the fifties or you get consistent weather in the spring, again, you might be in the fifties, say you're at 55 and things are, the conditions are beautiful. The sun's out, fish are getting more aggressive. And all of a sudden the big cold front comes down, shuts them down a bit. Then I'll go back to that Sonic side. But when I'm getting consistent weather, I love the S crank. I also love the S crank. And I mentioned it earlier, fishing over flats when I'm not hitting like over top of vegetation or those flats that have a mixed boulder, sand, weed, and I'll burn this thing with the odd stop, give it a twitch and then burn it. It really kind of moves off to the side, to the left, to the right. It really triggers some, some of those aggressive strikes. So those are my two reasons I would use the, either the S crank or the song side. I love this, uh, the, the gill in the, um, Man, I'm all over the board. There's so many colors. I've been working on a project, and I'm, I'm colors. I know this color. Yeah, so that, that one right there. Anybody knows what that is? They can yeah. see it right now. That's my go-to, like natural color. You know, sun, sun cloud. You know, calm. Man, this gets them. And I, I fish it everywhere. I fish it in the Finger Lakes. I catch a lot of fish with it. I fish it up here. I fish it on St. Clair early in the season. Uh, you know, and I'll be fishing in Ontario early in the season when those fish are shallow. I really love that bait. This sexy mega bass is like one of my favorite baits too. Very natural, you know, has that shad kind of feel. Again, if I'm fishing it on the Great Lakes, this color is kind of my go-to. The other one I really like is the, uh, let me open up my box of goodies here. Uh, you know, nothing better than looking at someone's crankbait box, by the way, like looking at someone's sneaky crankbaits. That's always, yeah. Fun. Like this, you know, Brown and chartreuse has been one of my favorite crankbaits in any crankbait. I have deep divers, medium divers, squill, square bills. I have a lot of confidence in this color, but this color, if I get into like water where there's any kind of stain, even in clear lakes, you get a little bit of stain. This crankbait is deadly. I love it around vegetation, you know, probably, mimics you know maybe a sunfish or perch style uh this bait it's a solid color so again you know any kind of wind i get a little ripple on the water sun cloud mix this color is deadly in the sonic side i i love this this one man if you guys ever want to get a color you know pick up a few of these i've caught them in clear now in flat calm days no but i just need something a little bit of wind some sun cloud mix cloudy days this thing is deadly so those are those are my two uh, S crank. The other color that I really love is the uh, Kokuku Reaction, which I'm trying to see if I have it here. Give me a second here. 
especially smallmouth too. Like, don't be afraid if water is a little bit clear, but you have ripple on the water, you have chop, or you have, you know, low light conditions. Don't yes. be afraid necessarily to go to a more chartreuse based crankbait, right? Like, it doesn't Listen, have to be nasty water. No, I no. I truly believe there's not enough chartreuse in the world for smallmouth. I mean, there's a bite that we get on down here that we literally take a chartreuse swim bait. And we yep. paint the sides more chartreuse <laughs> because like the small mouth, it's like the more chartreuse you got on it, the more pissed off they are at it. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. That's the other one there. The Buaco clear. This one is, Ooh, you know, it's, it's, it's a see-through. It's got the blue back, but this one is deadly too. And again, I, I find for whatever reason, this is the one crankbait. I could catch them in flat, calm, sunny conditions and I can catch them in wind too. I don't know what it is. It, again, you know, thing about mega bass is pretty cool so on a sunny day it's hard for you guys to see it in the video this is kind of more what it would look like on a cloudy day it almost comes out solid it has a little bit of sheen but the more light penetration the more sun rays that are getting through the water it almost has a very ghost-like appearance almost mm -hmm. whitey a little bit chartreuse -y, but that sun does get through it it almost gives it a little bit of a glow um you know it has like just a little spray of orange on the belly man this this bait is deadly, and I also love this. I know we'll get to it, but in that deep six, they make this mm -hmm. same color. This is one of the colors that I that I that I won the tournament on. I've caught countless big smallmouth in ultra clear water in cloudy days, sun. That color is deadly. Any crankbait you can get that color in that Mega Bass makes, get it, and you'll be you'll be in good shape. And that chartreuse blue, blue is so good. Like any sort of like pearlescent sided bait, like pearlescent yeah. chartreuse with a little bit of powder blue or blue on the back is so good. Like that's my all time favorite smallmouth color. Yeah. Yeah. Dead, but dead. Dude, one of the cool things about Mega Bass too is the amount of like color science there is yeah, with like yeah. matte colors and, yes. and your, oh my gosh, there's un, un, Believable amounts of colors. It's endless. It, it's yeah. endless. And I, you know, a lot of guys get confused. They're like, man, I go there and I get up on the wall and I see so many colors. It drives me crazy. I'm like, you don't have to buy all hundred colors. You don't. But you know, like in jerk baits, we I talk about like I break them down into like that SP, so that matte color, and it comes in many different patterns. And then there's the see through stuff. And then there's the GG, which is reflective, right? So I tell guys, have a couple in the GG, have a couple SPs. Right. And a couple of see throughs. Right. And generally it's a, for me, I keep it simple at the beginning and then I get into it in depth more as I'm seeing what the fish are telling me. Right. So, you know, that matte finish really works well uh, in cloudy days that shows up nicely. And it's also good early morning. So low light, that sun's not coming down. It's off to the side and shining on top of the surface. That matte is really good. The see-through, like calm, sunny days, that's just my standard that I start with. And then any kind of wind, sun cloud mix, wind, uh, turbulence on the surface, that GG finish in the jerkbait is fantastic. I, I play, I sort of work off that a little bit with crankbaits, but a lot of, you know, sometimes with crankbaits, I prefer to match the hatch kind of depending on what's going on. Jerkbait's kind of the one thing I, I almost don't even match the hatch. I, I have... You know, these standards that I follow off and then, I, you know, yeah, I'll have a couple that will match the hatch, but it's not my end all be all. But with crankbaits, yeah, like if I know they're eating perch, I want to go to some kind of perch pattern. If I know they're eating shad, I like that, you know, silvery gold, something like that, that kind of matches that. But, you know, again, that plus conditions plays a role right and then sometimes mm -hmm. you know like throwing something different that other guys aren't you know if i'm going through mm -hmm. across an area that i know 10 boats have gone through i'm not going to throw a perch because i know everybody that's got a crankbait in front of me just threw that perch. so mm -hmm. i'm going to try something different and it might be something totally gaudy like what the heck is that guy doing he could see it from a mile away mm -hmm. i'm going to pitch it because i know if i can retrieve it fast enough i might trigger something in a small mouth that'll get him to eat Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to go to something supernatural that maybe, you know, a guy may not want, you know, or may not be the right conditions for something that's translucent. I'm going to throw it. It still has mm -hmm. that ghost like appearance. And believe me, you know, these fish, they're predators, man. They, if it's making noise, they'll find it, especially yep. in clear water. Right. Yep. 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 I was about to say that they're super predators. I mean, like people, yeah. people get so scared to throw jerk baits in dirtier water. And like I've literally had people, you know, be fishing a jerk bait in in semi dirty water, almost muddy water, and they're like, "Man, it's too dirty for a jerk bait." And I'm like, "I got 20 pounds that says it ain't." Like, you know, they they will if they're shallow enough and they're aggressive enough, man, they will track it down and they will they will kill it. 
So hey, quick question for you, just since we're kind of in the shallow water realm of things. And yeah. I, I, I'm, you're about to get into like the geeky tackle geek side of me really quick. Do you ever play with the older bosses, the cranks? Do you got any of those and do you play with them? Yeah. Yeah. I have a couple and they're really good, man. And you know, yeah. I basically, yeah, they, they are amazing baits, man. I yeah. have, a, I have a couple of the older ones I got when I first came in with mega bass, the rep here gave me a couple of them. Mm -hmm. They're fantastic. But over time, I've kind of like put them aside. They're kind of like my little baby and I don't really, I use them from yeah. time to time, but yeah, it, it, totally different, right? Wood is just yeah. a, a whole different ball game, but they're yeah. amazing, man. Yeah. I started discovering those and just kind of, you know, I, I'm not talked about them a ton, but I, I, they're the closest thing I've found to some of these old hand carves. Like right. these do like out of the garage kind of deal. Yeah. And right. like I the first one I ever got, I got it out of the package and I was looking at it. And I was like, man, this is to be mass produced. I was like, this is this is good. Like this is close. Yeah. You know what I mean? And just yeah, just the way it fishes and the action of it, it's it's very unique. I was just wondering if you'd ever kind of played with them or, or touched them and just kind of yeah. you know, felt yeah. that, yeah. You know. Yeah, I can't say that I've really used any in tournaments. Oh, like again, most of the tournaments, like it just like a square bill is just rare in some yeah. cases. Like I there, I'm sure there's been a few tournaments where I have one tied on or I've caught one good key fish, yeah. but you know, generally just like, and that's the thing here, right? Like when yeah. COVID came in, the first thing I said to myself, I said, man, this would be a perfect opportunity for me to kind of get to play with some new lakes, have some fun, maybe fishing largemouth. I mean, up here, you can't win a tournament on largemouth. You're just mm. not. There are certain some smaller tournaments where you can, but mm -hmm. you get into the Great Lakes, you're going to get your butt kicked. I don't care, mm -hmm. you know. Some of the elites have have made the top ten in the river, but you won't make the top ten fishing largemouth if the lake is open. You're done. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. forget it's not. Yeah, happen, you know? yeah. <laughs> so see, that, that's just kind of opposite down here. Like I'm thinking when springtime rolls around, I'm thinking there are seven and eight pounders laying up in four foot of water that want to eat a square meal. <laughs> like that's where I need and to that's be. That's where I want to be too. Like, well, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I thought I'd be doing that. Oh, it's talking a, a little bit earlier, Benjamin, but I, I said, I wanted to maybe do some traveling. I wanted to go down South and spend a little time down there now, just the way things are, but you can't cross the border. It's been hard. Uh, oh, but yeah, yeah I would yeah. love to get down there and do some of that crankbait stuff down there. It'd be incredible. We'll smuggle you in. We'll, Thanks, we'll man. Yeah. <laughs> well, guy, I'll fit in a suitcase, man. Like, yeah, there you go. I'll get myself <laughs> over if I got to. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so yeah, getting back. So the lipless ones, uh, you know, this um, uh, Bahama banana, banana Bahama, this one here, it's a white, but it really has a very chartreuse -y kind of like ghost-like appearance on the inside. It, again, on a, on, a, on a cloudy day, it'll come out very white. This is one of my favorites. I just love, I have a lot of confidence burning a white lipless bait uh, on dark days they just seem to react to it really nicely but in the sun it really comes out with a very kind of again that halo of chartreuse on the inside really hard to say but if you put it up to the light it really does give it a chartreuse that's a really go-to and then this the gill is my other you know every day all out or the concurro that gold with the with the orange belly they're two of my favorites just for triggering you know, uh, up here we have some of our northern lakes have that kind of tea stain. So they're still mm -hmm. very clear, but they have that darker water to them yeah. from sediment that comes off the trees and, and the surrounding area. Gold and orange is deadly up there. So any guys listening that's fishing that north country, man, gold and orange is, is killer up there. But I've caught them, again, it, gold and orange was one of our favorite jerkbait colors back in the days, like in a lot of these clear lakes. So it, it works oh, yeah. up here too. Yeah, no oh, doubt. Yeah. And that's one of the cool things too, man, is like uh, you keep talking about these these bait fish or perch style colors or bluegill style colors. Like that works all across the north. I don't care if you're yeah. throwing a lip this. I don't care if you're throwing a deep diver. I don't care what you're throwing. Like those gill style colors with the bars, semi-translucent or even opaque sides, like they just work really, really well um, because we have so much um, bluegills and perch. And, and that's right. Yeah. Those panfish style bait. Very yeah. yeah, and when we get to the bigger, like this, this, um, I think this is called uh, uh, shadow gill, I believe. This one here, this is very translucent, but it has you know the orange belly, but everything's very see through on this bait. But this is one of my favorite baits in clear water, actually, even in like some dirty, dirtier water, some lakes that are stained. Again, it matches just that perch, the the the, the sunfish 
pretty much what the bass eat, right? The gobies in the Great Lakes have kind of changed a little bit of what fish are eating. But, you know, a lot of people think that, you know, even in the Great Lakes, they're just, man, they eat gobies and that's all they eat. It's not true. I mean, they, they still eat, you know, those, those shad, those, you know, herring, uh, you know, smelt or anything, ciscos that are coming in, especially towards late summer and fall. Those, those, they have schools of those that come through these structures. And at any time, small mouths see them. It's like, it's like candy. So they're eating, they probably eat gobies quite a bit. There's no question about it, but they'll, they'll go off and still eat those shads. So then I get into my shad colors. Uh, you know, the sustain our stained uh, reaction is really good. Um, this is a little gem I have. It's a JDM color, but mm -hmm. you can see it's Ooh, got just a little so splash of chartreuse and, uh, you know, very see-through down the back. They, a lot of times it's kind of weird, but I find when I, when I, when, when they eat this, they're always eating it head first. Yep. So the hook, it's always that front hook that they get. Mm -hmm. I love this bait in like super clear water, calm conditions. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's one of my favorites. And then, you know, even this, like this, the craw, dark craw here yeah. again, you know, and the funny thing is, is that we talk about visual, but actually this bait I've done very well on cloudy, dark days. Mm -hmm. It has just a splash of orange underneath the belly. And you picture that bait hitting the rock and kind of rolling off to the side. One thing that guys don't know about the X 300 and the X six, it's the same thing. It has a weight transfer system, but when the ball comes down to the head, the chamber actually slides to each eye. So the, the, mm. the premise behind that is when that bait hits and it kicks to either the left or the right, that ball falls into that chamber and exaggerates the roll more so, right? So it kind mm. of rolls off more, kicks over here, rolls back more. So it really gets a lot of that belly. We used to actually take some nail polish and I would just run a little bit more orange down the back end of this thing. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's deadly on dark days. Hmm. I don't know, probably because they don't see a lot of it, but that orange flash kind of kicks here and there and yep. can trigger that bait. That's another really good color. But that I mean, is so cool. I did not know that about the bait. I was actually going to ask like the differences between the 300 and the, or what is it? The, the X, deep six. six or deep six. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Almost the same bait. Uh, the deep six is, I almost like look at it as like a finesse deep diving crankbait. It mm. glides through the water so easy. It's not like a typical deep diver that really pulls on your rod. You get a lot of resistance. It actually almost feels, I remember the first time I used it, I'm like, this thing's not working. Like what's going on with this? Thing? You know, I pick it up, shake it to make sure the balls were all good in it, mm. cast it again. And it just slides through the water so easy. It, it's actually one of those crankbaits where you could get away with throwing a little bit faster in the summertime because you're, it's not pulling on you as hard, right? Mm. They're very similar. The only difference, really the difference between the two actions, very close. The, the X 300 is a 12 to 15 foot bait. The deep six is like, you know, real world. It's like 16 to 18 feet guys mm. that are getting longer cast, maybe go to a little bit lighter line. I've touched 18 feet. I know some guys said they could get it down to 20, but me personally, I haven't hit 20, but you're, you're really close. You're mm. almost down there, you know? But man, they're both, you know, not every crankbait that's out there is a fish catching bait. Some of them you, you'll you get to know. I know I'm sure that you go out and you've tried because you're not with anybody. You've tried a lot of different crankbaits and there are a lot of good ones. But for sure, the X300 and a Deep Six are two fish catching crankbaits. I, they're mm -hmm. my go-tos in the summertime when I want to get deep. I will almost exclusively use these and just play around with color. At some point, I get bit on them. They're they're fantastic. That's awesome. I was always curious. I mean, I, I'll be honest. I haven't really played around with the Mega Bass um, crankbaits very much. I've played yeah. with the S-crank, but hearing you kind of break down the intricacies and like the thought process that goes into these different baits that makes them what they are is, is really, really cool. Yeah. You know, the thing is about the, the, the X300 and the Deep Six is that most people would think that that's a very aggressive crankbait in a lot of ways it is but because the way it slides through the water so easy it doesn't have that same pull on it you start getting into those more translucent colors and natural colors it could be a very finesse bait in in like super clear water so i mean i, I just find that i can get in behind people or fish in clear water and still get bit on these where you know guy throwing maybe another one that's a little bit more aggressive doesn't get those bites on those kind of days so you know, I, for sure, for somebody that's looking for a clear, clear water and a more finesse approach to deep, those deep sixes and the X 300s are deadly. That's, hmm. so cool. that's awesome. And then, 
I think we'll just wrap it up talking about hooks. Do you do anything special with hooks? Is it just typically standard round bends? I mean, yeah, you know what? I there I I do. I'm trying to think of the name. There is. I'll make a switch to a an owner. Uh, I don't have the package here, but the ST thirty five. Yeah, I think so. I think that's what it is. Yeah. So I, I don't mind the hooks that Mega Bass has on the X300 and Deep Six. They're good hooks. They're pretty stout. They're solid. Uh, yeah. These ones are a little bit on the X300 goes to the out barbs, uh, where the Deep Six has the bigger the bigger hook. I have a okay. package here. It's kind of hard to see, but you can see that. Mm -hmm. That hook's yeah. a little bit stout. So, yeah, I will, in some cases, bend these out in the summertime. So I'll go to that owner a little bit more stout or even the EWG. I just find it, you know, once you get the hooks in, it locks the fish in better. Mm -hmm. uh, but that deep six, I don't, I rarely lose fish. I will lose some in the summertime when they get nuts on these. So I'll switch them to a little bit heavier gauge hook on the X300s. But otherwise, on the rest of them, I, I don't really... The hooks that they come with are really good. The the S cranks, the uh, Sonic sides, they're solid hooks. They they Mega Bass plays around with a lot of different companies. It's not one company that makes their hooks, so they'll use some VMCs, they'll use some Gamma Gatsus. They have some different different companies on different hooks. But the Deep Six, I honestly I love them. But yeah, with the X three hundred, I'll go to a, a little little heavier gauge hook. That's cool. Yeah, I'm pretty much the same way. Like, I may occasionally mess around with different hooks, but for yeah. the most part, it's like a standard round bend treble hook, especially smallmouth. They yeah. slap at the bait a lot. Like, my biggest yeah. thing yeah. is I just want to have a chance to get, hook them. Like, if they're going to hit the bait, like, give That's me as right. big of a chance to hook them, and then mm -hmm. I can worry about fighting them to the boat. So, like, yeah, the biggest thing with a lot of guys talk about EWG treble hooks, especially when you're talking largemouth and yeah. whatever, Different. this, that, and the other. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they get the bait really good, you might get them, but smallmouth yeah. with as much as they just come hit that bait and they just come up and try to hit it and kill it. Mm -hmm. The round bend treble just tends to get these fish pinned a little bit easier than yeah. like an EWG where it starts to point in and you might. So Ben, you're a hundred percent right. When we talk about like uh, when we were fishing with jerk baits back in the days, those EWGs got really popular and they were the worst hooks on a jerk bait because mm -hmm. if you got that bait, if you got a fish to eat that back hook, say he's hooked and now he's taken out, the chance of you getting another one of those hooks in with the EWG is next to none. But a regular round bend, he can jump and then another hook gets in him. All of a sudden you got two hooks or you got three hooks. So 100% smallmouth is just a different ball game. And their heads are, they're like, they're built like a, like a tank. Mm -hmm. So trying to get a hook into their face, it's ridiculous, right? That's why those small drop shot hooks are so good because they're so thin and they penetrate so easily. Trying to get one of these bigger hooks in. If you have EWGs on a regular basis, yeah, it, it's hard. On a crankbaits, I, I, I find that, you know, the hookup ratio is still good, but I will never use them with jerkbaits. But you're absolutely right. Regular round bends, you can't go wrong. And then one final thing. Sorry, I know I said last time. But yeah. <laughs> do you lock it down? Do you lock down your drag and play with your thumb, or do you have a, a drag and let those fish play like your baitcaster drag, or what is your perspective? Yeah, I, I, I honestly, I lock it down. Now, if I get into a real big fish, Sometimes I'll, I'll back off on, on, on the drag when they get close to the boat, but yeah. usually I'll open the bale and just thumb them out. And, you know, but if they, yeah. some of them in the summertime, they get so crazy, it's not as easy as you think. And they, you know, sometimes that little bit of a jerk with your thumb on that line is just enough for them to, to release. Right. So, yeah. it, you know, but yeah, most of the time, yeah, it's, it's buried. <laughs> it's buried. Yeah. That's me too, man. Like yeah. I, I fight small balls so hard just in yeah. general, yeah. right? Like, if I hook them on a drop shot, so many guys and you're open water, right? But so many guys are like, fight them real slow. I'm like, that fish is going to go nuts whether I fight them real slow or I get them to the boat. So <laughs> my right. goal is like, I'm going to set this hook and yeah. get this fish coming to the boat and you better just have that net ready in about 14 yeah. seconds, right? You're hundred percent right. Same thing with nice. like the, yeah. the most yeah. Yeah. times I lose fish is when they jump. And if I can just let them jump once instead yeah. of jump three times, so, and I'll tell you, yeah. northern smallmouth lose their mind worse it's than ridiculous. smallmouth down here. I mean, like, these smallmouth down here, for the most part, they're river smallmouth. You know, they live in, under the TVA dams. You know, they're they're long, they're slender, they're still pissed off. But those fish up there, man, 
lose they got the, their they got the girth behind them too. Oh, here, they right? do. They do. Yeah. So like yeah. our fish are like rockets. You know what yeah. I mean? They they'll rocket themselves out of the water and we'll get them in. You know, we'll catch 22 and 23 inch fish down here, smallmouth yeah. that are four pounds. Yeah. You catch a 23 inch fish up there, it's going to be an eight pounder. You know, they're huge. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. And dude, right. they're just so, you know, this year, you know, even though I've been coming up north and fishing for going on, this will be my sixth year coming up this year. Um, I lost some fish kind of the first few days I was there because I just didn't, <laughs> I wasn't used to it yet. You know yeah. what I mean? And when yeah. I finally kind of got that gear turned back of like, Hey, I'm up here with these bigger, more pissed off smallmouth. Yeah. I started putting fish into the boat and dude, they That's just, right. they lose their mind, man. Uh, you know, my partner is like the opposite of me. Right. So I'm like Ben, even with a drop shot, I'm fairly aggressive, you know, and my rod's got a little bit more, you know, a belly weight to it so you can really haul on them and tire them out i got mm -hmm. a buddy and i'm not going to say anything and i'm not going to say what what rods he uses but man it's six pound test and when the fight starts i might as well get myself a coffee <laughs> before i get that net. <laughs> because i'm just like dude you you asked for the net but it's like two minutes later yeah. and you, you, that fish might die before you actually get him <laughs> in the boat so my buddy yeah. dirt get it going i love, I love dirts but man if he hooks a fish <laughs> on the drop shot like you feel terrible for like making another flip out to there. Yeah. But man, it's, <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> Hold up. You get read a book, watch yeah. a TV program, listen to oh. this podcast twice yeah. over. And like, you know, yeah. no, I'm, I'm too ADD. I can't do that, man. Oh, like, I, if yeah, I was a kid too, now, I'd be on every drug there is. There's no way yeah. I could sit there and wait for that fish to come to the boat. What was funny is earlier we were talking about deep cranking and I was thinking, man, deep cranking for me some days is like, Drink a monster, let the full ADHD take hold, and like a squirrel on crack out there, just you know, here we go, man. And like oh, people, awesome, that, you man. know, I'll make videos and people will be like, dude, aren't you reeling that thing a little fast? I'm like, nope, can't just a little bit faster. Let's go, let's go, let's go. So oh, that's dude. funny. Uh, well, I had fun, man. Yeah, Thank you so great, much man. for hopping on. Um, Thank thanks you, everyone man. that hopped in here and joined us. But yeah. Nick, kind of talk about you know, if you're in Ontario area, I know you work with Pro J. Um, yeah, they carry a ton of mega bass stuff. Like what is that about? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, you know, my, my major sponsor is mega bass of America. Pro J's is here in Toronto. They're, they are the biggest mega bass dealer in Canada. And they're actually one of the biggest independent dealers in North America. So that's how big they are. I mean, they carry everything. You walk in there, there's like a hundred uh, jerk bait colors. They carry every rod. They're probably one of the only dealers that actually get, you know, the arms rod, which is a custom built, rod they're crazy money you can actually call and customize the the color of the th they actually order like 10 of them and have them in the store so guys mm. can put it in their hands but you know carbon handles like just crazy stuff but those guys just have whatever you need they're super good they're very well versed on the mega bass stuff and anything else but they're a very high-end store they carry they carry other stuff they carry just regular stuff but if you're the guy that's looking for some specialty tackle uh you know they have them you know, so yeah, them and Mega Bass are just a a perfect blend. So I got on board with with Pro Jays as well, and super stoked with them. You know, I'm with uh, Smith Optics is my sunglass sponsorship. I just got on with Dirty Jigs, which is another great company. I was using a lot of their swim bait heads, so pretty excited to be with them. And uh, you know, I've been with Sims for a long time, and uh, you know, I miss and Daiwa Canada. I do all my reels with Daiwa, so pretty happy you know and and again um pro jays is a big uh dealer with daiwa as well so that's good. awesome man. yeah that is awesome well yeah. thank you so much for hopping thank on you. alex thank you for hopping on and everyone that was hanging thank out here alex. listening yeah, yeah, it's good to meet you dude it's good yeah, to talk great to, to you. Meet you for sure yeah for sure if but, i ever um, make it up canada way I'll, I'll hit you up listen you ever want to come up in the fall for a uh, seven eight pound smallmouth you give me a call and i'll yes. get you on them fast be a lot Let's of do it. Let's by do the it. way nick has this awesome awesome series on uh yeah. youtube yeah where he goes right. and tries to catch an eight pounder that's and right we're not gonna give up too much but oh my god dude yeah insane 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 yeah. stuff so go over check out nick's channel it's linked down in the description below thank uh, you Check him out on Instagram. He posts giant smallmouth all the time and really cool baits. Yeah. So thank, thank you guys you. for joining. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you guys are listening on podcasts, check us out on YouTube. Come over, interact with us. And uh, if you're not listening to the podcast, all streaming platforms, thank you guys for listening. Take care, Ted Lines. God bless. Pursue your passion.